What's up, everybody? Welcome to the View from Jamestown podcast edition. This is episode 75, and we have a very special guest this morning. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Of course. I think you're, you're one of, if not the first guest post COVID era. So it's nice to have some new faces here on the episode. I drove here myself. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for anyone in the audience that doesn't know Kathy, uh, Kathy is the executive director of product management for the Opus Global Petrochemicals business. I know we've known You've known TCC and specifically, I guess, Ray and others within the organization for quite a while. And, and you. Yeah, myself yes. as well. I guess I'm I'm not like the new guy in the industry anymore. I, no. feel, I feel like I've been the new guy and still am the new guy, but... Nor the young guy. Yeah, yeah. We got younger faces now, yeah. which is weird. <laughs> for you. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's great to, great to have you in the episode. Appreciate you driving up and taking some time to join us. So um, I think getting right into it, I think it'd be interesting to start with, you know, you personally, your, your background, um, how you got into where you are today and, and, you know, kind of where you spent your career. Sure. Um, so I began writing about petrochemical markets um, about 25 years ago for a large global publishing company. And in 2007, I, well, in 2004 and five, really, I had uh, begun seeing a lot more activity in ethylene and propylene markets. And I didn't feel that anybody was really reflecting this. And it was, um, you know, again, in large companies, you can have a little bit of slowness to market. And I was so anxious that I started my own newsletter that was devoted to ethylene and propylene spot market transactions, news of the day. It was called the Petrochem Wire, and I started this in 2007 as a daily email PDF. I came to add in certain aspects of that supply chain that centered on ethylene, propylene, and at the time also benzene. Uh, so bookending that would be the NGLs, the ethane, the propane, the butane. And on the other side of that would be the uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, that sort of thing. So that's uh, that's where that began in 2007. Did that um, as a independent company for a good 10 years. And then in 2018, we sold the company. It was acquired by Opus. Opus at the time had been owned by IHS Market. Since then, Opus has been sold to Dow Jones. So that is our parent company. So we are Opus by Dow Jones, and Petrochem Wire is a brand within the Opus family. Got it. Yeah, I think it's interesting thinking back to like 2005, 2007 type for time frame. Like we take email and podcast and social media for granted, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's, I guess one of probably the first, if not the first industry publication talking about these raw materials and what's happening in, in kind of a concise format. Yeah, with the frequency that we were doing it, that was really our hook was that this was a, it was every day, but it was also very short. Yep. So this was not a, a monthly 100 page thing. It was not a weekly 50 page thing. It was two pages every day. And you could read at the top, no trades, and close your email and feel like you were informed. So we always came at this in a sense like we were the newspaper of those industries. Now, what what I've come to uh, do now in the, the new parent company space is we're looking at global expansion. We've been watching these markets, obviously, for years as they affect the U.S., but we're looking to uh, to really expand and bring that same vigor of our coverage to the European and Asia markets. But we'll be talking about those today because global volatility, I mean, we're all linked no matter how much you might feel like this is just something in your backyard. It, it really isn't. And, and we've learned that more than ever in the past few years. Yeah. And so when you started it so in those 10 years that you really ran it independently, um, you were, you're hyper-focused on just the U.S. markets for the most part. Yeah, that was our, our real interest. And that's where... I'm happy to say we built um, industry benchmarks there. So that's where we focused all of our energy on becoming as useful as possible to the, to the primary stakeholders in that market. Our thought being, if this is useful to them, other people will find this to be useful. So like a butterfly effect. And that's what I think has happened. On the, um, the futures exchanges, the, uh, the CME and ICE, they do have ethylene and propylene futures contracts that do settle against the daily prices of the petrochem wire. Sure. So that's enabled a degree of risk management. ICE also has a benzene contract. So there's um there is a degree of risk management that you could do through the supply chain without having to back into something like natural gas, which might not have such a direct correlation. Right, right. 
Um, and before, I think before we get into what we're seeing today with some of these raw materials and what you're actively tracking them, you know, I know you talked about a little bit in the beginning, but maybe talk more about kind of your background a little bit, how you got to into this. Are you are you more of a like a, a writing and communications background? Did you have a chemical background? How did you how did you decide to? You know, I did start not this? have a chemicals background. I, I had a, a me either. So we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, I had a, a journalism background, and when I came into the publishing world as a young lady this was the subject matter. So I approached it in my job interview of, I don't understand the subject matter, but if you're looking for a copy editor or someone to uh, to assist with the editorial section, I have that talent. And as time wore on, I um, I really developed quite an affinity for plastics. And uh, they just, they really resonated with me in terms of manufacturing and you can really work your, your macroeconomics back into your household. And that was very interesting to me to see where the commodity elements of that lie. So that's really where I grew my own expertise, had a lot of lessons from all the you know, various leaders in the industry that I'm very grateful for. And I still, we, we're always learning, you know, I'm learning from, uh, you know, from Ray and Rob and people at, at companies all over just telling me, this is how this works. This is how it used to work. This is how it works now. And we're always learning nuances. And it's, I'm sure, been interesting as technology changes and, you know, went from the email publications, now you're doing podcasts and things like that. So yes. as, as the technology develops and... Yeah, things like, you know, phone calls are now WhatsApp messages. You yep. know, that there's, um, you know, there there is a degree of progress um, in all sorts of information transmission. There's screens where there didn't used to be screens and... Um, yeah, and, and obviously, you know, it's uh, more your world than mine, but logistics tracking is a lot, uh, it's, it's just a lot different than it was even 10 years ago. So yep. there's efficiencies, but you also, I think you also know fewer people personally sometimes yeah. because you're not calling somebody up saying, where's my shipment? You're just clicking on something saying, there's my shipment. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I think with our industry too, how how big of a role email still plays. You know, a lot of companies it's Slack messages or WhatsApp or whatnot, and those all play a role in it. But you know, for us, like we kind of live and die by emails, whether it's pricing or updates on shipments or whatnot. We talk to our IT folks all the time about you know, oh, after a couple of years, you'll you know, emails will go in this folder or whatnot. But it's like you still need to have access to all that because that's really your that's your record keeping. That's where everything is. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the same all over, and also I think that um, we we did gain the world and many industries gained a lot of efficiencies or learned things about um, telecommuting and virtual meetings and virtual conferences. But when, um, when things have begun to open up for certain events, I just find that they're so joyous. They're usually bigger than people had estimated, you know, that there's, there's a a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of interest in making relationships and you know again i mean you and i have have talked about i could have done this at home but i'd like to be here with you and it was it's been really great spending time with the folks up here yeah and and obviously i know we've seen each other a lot at various cities and shows you know things like the afpm and the coding show that had great turnouts for those you know kind of post-covid events Mm -hmm. and it's you know i think like emails and and whatnot it's you know in-person events is still a massive part of our industry we were talking last week about you know kind of our marketing strategies and things we do, and that the trade show and events piece is a big part of that. It's you know it still is that it's a, a big in person industry. Yeah, well, especially I I find that um, the more friends you have, the better informed you are. So, yeah. especially being someone whose entire focus is information transmission, it's knowing who to talk to about something to find out if something is even true. If it is true, what's the best way to portray that? If there are things that are misunderstood, can we clarify that? You know, some of the topics that uh, that we were even talking about at, uh, at breakfast today included the Superfund tax and yeah. what's happening with ports in Asia. And everybody has a puzzle piece that we can all put together. It's so much easier conversationally, I find, that... Um, that's it. That's why I mean, and also people are fun, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yep. but yeah. Well, that that was a big reason. Obviously, we started the you know the podcast. I mean, Rob did a newsletter even you know long before my time. It's just a, a word document going out on emails. I used to send you charts for it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's right. And and but so I mean, Rob was doing this even prior to our time. And then you know we started the podcast four or five years ago, and same thing, just to put information out there. You know, obviously we see 
people a lot at trade shows and events, but to be able to put information out, just continue to be a good partner. You know, we talk a lot about security of supply and it goes beyond just having the physical product. It's the information, what's happening, what we're seeing. You know, we always say if, if customers and suppliers, we're obviously not, we can't predict the future, but a lot of what we talk about, we're kind of seeing microcosms of what's to come and just having that information and listening to, you know, our podcast and the other podcast and your emails and all the information that's out there to kind of, like you said, put the pieces together. Yeah. Um, that's That's been a big part of us, you know, starting this. Sure. You know, and when an event does happen, like um, I was just thinking about the winter storm in Texas in um, in two, uh, 2021. Which the fact that we're still talking about that is wild to me. It's still affecting markets, yeah. though. You know, I mean, it really, a lot of a lot of plants didn't start up until almost the end of the year. There, there were some very severe situations. But again, having that network of, yes, we understand that for a time, every plant in Texas was shut. We get it. And that yep. was more severe than anybody had predicted. Yep. But, you know, after the weather passed, it was still staying in touch with people saying, I might, the plant might be running, but I can't actually get anything to you. Or, you know, just putting, again, it's, I look at this as, as puzzle pieces and putting together all the different parts creates your fundamentals so something about you know why has propylene done this or that it's not so mysterious when you actually look at the three or four different things that you've been hearing this week you know um i don't know if you want to get into what's happening in the market because yeah, i, I was jump, thinking jump right about this me and my anxiety what are we going to talk about and then <laughs> looking at benzene i'm like obviously we're going to be talking about benzene we got, we got plenty to talk about i think and with with benzene the um obviously we're reaching you know we're wondering this morning and i i could research this if this is a historic high of all time i'm not sure if it's of all time because being in the industry for decades maybe not but it's nothing that anybody at the table could remember this morning. Yep. And there was a lot of experience there. So, yes, yeah, $6, 650 660 These are extremely high prices. And that, you know, meanwhile, overnight, I was seeing from my colleagues in Asia, prices were down that, if my math is right, they're down below $5. So, great, there might be an arbitrage. How quickly can the material get here? Are the ports even open that yep. have access to the material? So there's still a lot of things. It's not as simple as, you know, wishing the benzene to show up. You need to go find it and get the logistics in place, which is a challenge. You know, that uh, obviously we're still in the middle of a, a global health situation that, you know, it, it. I don't want to say comes and goes as if I'm an official, but, you know, you'll hear that, ports are open in Asia and plants are started and then recently you know ports are closed and plants are shutting so we're kind of waxing and waning on the effects of the labor force and and their health essentially and not to mention uh, you know just various uh, supply chain issues everything from freight to the delays in the shipments and you know all of this is a factor when somebody just wakes up and says what what happened to benzene well, it, you know there's there's not a lot of surprise maybe the degree of surprise i think about um with the winter storm that propylene at that time the polymer grade propylene in the states did hit a historic high of i think a dollar 25 per pound right so again nobody nobody was doubting that there was going to be some some rise in price they could see this coming for months different fundamentals were building that storm, if you were caught short or in a position, you really would pay anything to get it at that point. So that's right. where I know at the time in, um, I think it was February, people were saying, you know, why didn't anybody see this? I'm like, well, if it was 40 cents in November and people were predicting 70, 75, this is much more expensive. But it's really the, it's the dramatic degree that happened in the midst of a panic, right. which might be what's happening in benzene. I don't think anybody's been surprised that the price is rising, but 650, 660 kind of jumped up on people saying, I didn't really expect that. So we'll see. You know, volatility can be a friend to a trader, but volatility creates a lot of uncertainty, especially for those who are trying to manage risk through inventory control. That from what I've heard, in many markets that there's a lot of hesitancy with orders right now because we're just not sure what those orders are going to be valued at. 
And so it sounds like that the current benzene numbers we're seeing in the U.S. are higher than what you'd expect them to be based on like crude and natural gas and what we're seeing in those. Like there's there's kind of a larger correlation. Like obviously crude and natural gas are at highs, but it sounds like benzene's even higher than you might expect based on just economics. Yeah. Well, at certain times of the year, the aromatics complex becomes more in demand from the gasoline pool as well. And then if there are certain refinery issues and if all the downstream plants are running well, that creates a situation where high prices are supported. But then if there is any delay, the U.S. takes a lot of uh, material regularly from South Korea. If there's any delay in that, if there's a situation in Europe that um, you know, can also play into this, my understanding of prices in Europe is that they're, they're slightly lower than they are in the U.S. So you, you could source material from there if you had the right shipping rate right. because the, the general spot freight rates are now making it unprofitable to to ship. So nuances like that can really affect, especially when you're looking in, in the U.S., at least in the styrene plant space, there are not many styrene plants. So everyone's everyone's situation is specific to to their own needs. So that's, a, that's something to remember if you're looking at essentially a national styrene price. It's a, you know, again, if you've got less than five producers, that's, a, that's a, a small group of fundamentals to consider. Right. And so obviously I know this just happened overnight and this morning, but based on benzene coming down in Asia, do you expect benzene to start coming down in the U.S. or is it anybody's guess still at this point? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, it's something we were talking about this morning saying, okay, you see this happen. It's um, my understanding is that it's been happening a few days in a row sure. in Asia. So for me, that means I wake up, see our own opus reports and say, okay, this happened, this happened, it's down again, it's down again. Thinking about somebody that is now desperately looking for benzene in the States, even if they arrange the cargo today, when is it going to get here? So that's where if you still need material in June, it's not going to arrive if you place that order today. So right. that's where I feel like there could still be a little bit of a panic out there. Got it. You know, makes I, sense. I don't need any benzene <laughs> myself, <laughs> right? But, but I would imagine that you know the reason for the panic in the first place is that nothing seems to be on the horizon. Yeah. Um, and I guess before we get into some of those other raw materials, uh, do you find yourself thinking about and talking about like the logistics portion of these raw materials more so than maybe you have in the earlier parts of your career? I'd have to assume. Yeah. Like so, I started five, six years ago, and obviously at that point, logistics I think was starting to get more and more of a hot topic, and the driver shortage and whatnot. And then obviously, COVID certainly impact that. So, do you, I mean, do you find like the logistics piece of these raw materials, whether it's cargoes or trucks or whatnot, is a, a bigger factor than you're you're spending more time talking about day to day than maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago? Yeah, certainly. Um, for many years, I viewed logistics as synonymous with freight rate. This was all about making the arbitrage. Does this work? There wasn't so much a concern of the timing. There, there just wasn't. And in the past three years, again, this has been something that began brewing in one region and then started to affect another region and the knock-on effect when you're sending things to one region. How soon are you going to get the container back? What is it filled with? Is it being offloaded by trucks in what region? What's the trucking situation? There's a trucking strike in South Korea, I've just learned this week. This is a situation that, you know, again, the effect is seen globally. That, you know, this is um, obviously, this is, again, kind of going to my point about my interest in chemicals that affect your household and affect the world. You know, there there are workers in South Korea looking for a different situation that's re resulted in a, a trucker strike. That's affecting things everywhere. Yeah, just because you don't have a plant in South Korea doesn't mean that the South Korea trucking strike doesn't affect you. It, it may be two, three, four, five steps above whatever you're currently buying, but it's affecting the port. The, yeah. the port affects you. You know, as it is, every port right now, you know, for the past several years, has been affected by the health situation and different, uh, you know, as different protocols change and. Some ports you quarantine at, some not so much. Or, you know, are you, again, once you're at the port, what happens? Are you going onto a rail car? Are you going into a truck? What's the situation there? What country are you in? So, yeah, I, those are things that obviously, you know, I think we all intellectually understood they existed. Right. But who's really watching right. the, the, you know, the satisfaction of 
truck drivers in in a country that's not your own. Right. That um the the being sensitive and especially depending on certain markets, the freight rate of course is paramount. You know, if a market is unworkable or if you've lost a, a source of supply and now you're looking elsewhere and the freight rate is astounding and now you're facing your own supply shortfall or a possible force majeure because you can't find something like an additive or a catalyst. Are you willing to lose money on getting that? You know, these are decisions I've never seen people face in, in you know, the time I've looked at this. So that's where I think logistics becomes, um, a, I don't want to say a much bigger nuance because it's it, it logistics I don't think is necessarily the driver, but it certainly is a bigger fundamental than freight prices. Which... And, I, and I think it's safe to say it's going to continue going that way. It's going to continue being something people will talk about, be worried about, be thinking about globally. Yeah. I mean, I think the challenges that, that we've seen are, in some cases, the the worst case scenario. You know, we I mean, when you have active military conflicts that are affecting train Freight transport thing, you know. Just, so, in some situations or a health situation that's closing a port, these are worst case scenarios, and and they're happening in pockets all over the place and affecting the whole world. That um, I don't I don't see any immediate solution to a lot of them or anything that's going to prevent them from happening in other regions. But I think that kind of like any anything that we've discovered during the lockdowns and the pandemic, you learn things that you don't lose. You know, I'm, I might not go to the grocery store again because I'm so accustomed to the groceries appearing on my porch now, yep. you know, yep. that's something I've learned that it, it did exist five years ago, but I'm like, why would I do that? Right. Well, why wouldn't I do that? Appa <laughs> apparently. But, uh, but similarly looking at these situations now, even if everything well, you know, let's say one year from today, everything is stable. We're not going to forget. And we're always going to keep a backup plan. We're always, you know, we're always going to look for different stressors that, um, you know, in, in trading and pricing, you'll have support and resistance, right? That you'll have different measures of tolerance of if I start seeing this, I'm going to start paying more attention to that and start making a plan for this in case this happens because I didn't really bank on this happening the last time and remember what that did to us like you know that there's more uh, there's more of a cognizance of what if and uh and and planning for things to happen that you might previously have not have thought could happen yeah well like when i started you know it was very much kind of the end of like the whole just in, just just in time trucking situation you know you place an order you need a truck to deliver on the day that otherwise your plant's gonna run out of material and that yeah. just was the way it was for a long time and now we've got companies and especially companies that pay close attention to their purchasing or very cost cognizant on their purchasing maybe they put it out to bid every month or whatnot they're okay paying 30 cents more for a load of totes to have those totes sitting on the plant so that they don't shut their plant down because they know stuff happens so yeah something that you know if you, 10 years ago you said hey buy a load of totes to have sitting on the floor just in case people are like, no it's fine like it's you know it's gonna get here the truck's gonna show up no big deal now it's like all right let's talk about those totes again let's you know we're, we're okay paying that higher price and yeah. can send that up to our shareholders because they understand how important it is just to keep things running yeah so yeah and and i also think that um possibly some of the bigger winners are the people offering or the companies offering technology solutions in yep. in that space in logistics where a company like you say can can say we never had this problem in all of our years of business. Why would we want to invest in this, you know, real time tracking system? Yep. We're okay with the phone. Well, you know, maybe maybe you're doing things differently, sourcing internationally, or you 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 have different needs that you didn't expect that became crucial in the past two or three years where, like you say, you float this up to management saying this spend is now essential. Right, right. So yeah. So I know we talked a bit about benzene. Um what do you want to talk about next? Propylene? <laughs> propylene <laughs> it's in my heart um yeah e ethylene i always say is my my first true love and obsession propylene i have seen propylene become like a it, it moved from a like a twin product you know there was it was pretty equal to ethylene to 
um, the the shale revolution of you know 2005 to 2010, 11, 12, you saw every U.S. company making announcements based on the availability of the low cost raw materials. Where I remember, I think it was in 2005, Alan Greenspan addressed the AFPM via video, and he talked about LNG imports. How we can, how the U.S. can access the world's lowest cost um, natural gas through imports, and here we are. We're, you know, we're now the, some of the lowest cost on Earth. Yep. So, uh, so that really, really reversed a lot of thinking in terms of, you know, we're we'll be needing to import certain things that we're now exporting. And also it's, you know, it's made the entire ethylene chain a lot more competitive globally. But uh, but in terms of propylene, again, just uh, basic petrochemistry, when you're, when you're using ethane, for example, to make your ethylene, you're maximizing the ethylene production, minimizing propylene production. So when you're using heavier materials like naphtha or uh, even butane, you're making more of the propylenes and the aromatics and not as much as of the ethylene. So with so many, you know, the ethane being the cheapest in the world, it still is, um, making decisions to have ethane crackers and rely on ethane was, you know, a very popular one. But the result is it, uh, it decreased propylene production as a co-product very much. As a result of this loss of supply, I think, open the door for investments into on-purpose propylene through the, the PDH units. So then propane became a bigger constant in that market, um, for for the U.S. at least. But um, but in terms of, you know, how the, the propylene chain itself works, that you know, polypropylene is really the one to watch. And when you talk about global supply issues that, you know, with container ships and who's able to get product out and if you can't get product out and it's sitting at ports and you don't even have the rail cars to keep the storage at your own plant, things backing up into the system, you can have great domestic demand. But if you're reliant on any sort of sales outside that you can't meet, your system will back up on you. Um, so I think in the in the U.S., the propylene is exportable, the polypropylene is exportable, but again, they're dependent on the international prices, that Europe seems to be a very popular destination for a lot of things from the U.S., you know, ethylene and uh, propylene derivatives, but um, and Asia prices right now are coming down. This country does not have um, a propylene import infrastructure of, uh, of any significance, so it really is a situation where if propylene, it can create its own bubble. In my opinion, sometimes a little bit quickly, it can create a bubble of uh, an immediate need driving the market. There's inherently fewer people in the market because there's less production, there's less availability. So uh, so as a result, I personally think that's where you see more volatility. Ethylene will have a lot more people participating, a lot more supply a lot, um, a lot more. The fundamentals are are just multiplied. So, when you have more, you tend to have. You know, if uh, if one person has a, a big need, it doesn't last all that long because the market is smoothing itself out pretty regularly. Right. We're in propylene. If you have, in in theory, let's say of thirty participants in a market in a given day. And most of them are saying, I'm not touching this. And one person says, I need this. And somebody else says, I guess I can do this. Now it looks like we have a price spike. It's really the result of, of not a lot of activity, sure. but it's it's amplified. And then this gets put out to the entire world. Look what's happening here. And then, you know, if and if it's sustained, then you have the downstream market saying, we, we can't afford this. Right. So, um, so yeah, so we, we do have... Um, from what I've seen from my my U.S. colleagues here, you know, writing the Daily Petrochem Wire, that the propylene prices have come off, and they've come off, I think, globally a little bit. But you know, we'll see if that's a situation because markets were overheated, or if there's a little bit of a lull because it, you know it's the second half of the month, and let's see how things are playing out with logistics. But I think that certainly with 
the benzene derivatives, propylene derivatives, there is that sense of hesitancy for anybody to really make a big stake in the July or August markets in terms of their orders. Because there, as much as um, there are some brilliant forecasters, my colleagues included, it's like I was saying about the Texas storm. Everybody knew it was coming. Nobody knew every single plant in Texas would be shut. Right. Like the, there's an aspect of forecasting that is unknowable. So, and that's again, you know, pointing back to propylene, where the forecasts were saying prices could double from 40 cents. Well, they they tripled. Right. And that's where the market, you know, is coming to me. How, <laughs> nobody saw this. I'm like, well, yeah. Did double not mean anything? You double is is a pretty big jump. Right. Triple, I'm sorry, really, that really did ruin some people's day when the price went up as much as it did. And it made other people's day, of course, you know, the two sides to everything. But, yeah. but, uh, but again, you know, I think that what we're seeing now on some level, it, there's always a, a degree of trying to balance. So if we're seeing, if we're seeing things drop off in, in propylene, seeing how they're measuring against each other globally. We're seeing things drop off right now in Asia and benzene. How long is that going to to last here in the States? Again, what's the situation in Europe? Um, so, you know, all of those things, It's a, it really is a waiting game. We, I would assume that things would try to stabilize and, and reach a common point, which would imply prices might come off. And then by the time you're reading this, or seeing this or looking at this chart saying, you're totally wrong, Kathy. but <laughs> you know I'm, I'm I'm wrong a lot, and that's why I write the newsletter and don't trade the product. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean that's I think that that's the um, the conundrum worldwide in a volatile market is being able to conduct your business to a minimum degree, assessing the risk tolerance that you have. You know. Yeah, and it's it's all good and great to say that you know probably might be coming off. At the end of the day, you still need to run a business. You still need raw materials. So maybe you don't buy as much, or maybe you hope that things are going to come off a little bit. But yeah, it doesn't it, mean you don't buy at all. Right. Yeah. There's right. always demand. And what's more important, paying a little bit higher price this month to have material next month, or to you know run your plan out of material next month. That's obviously the game that luckily I don't have to I don't have to play. But a lot right. of put supply chain and purchasing people do, and that's like you said, putting the puzzle pieces together to try to figure out yeah. what the answer is for your business. Yeah, I think that um, that supply balancing has it's always obviously been a, a core fundamental of any market but supply balancing has uh, has really become quite an art in the past few years and you can look at that from the economic standpoint or try to forecast what's going to happen but then something like COVID happens or the storm or things nobody could ever obviously put into an economic forecast and that right. throws everything upside down and then you got to reevaluate i um I remember I talk about this a lot because I relate my own pandemic experience to the rest of the world because yep. I think I'm really average. And I remember when the lockdowns began in the States in uh, in mid-March thinking, this might go until May. This, <laughs> we might be locked down at the end of May. We could start the summer locked down. That, you know. Two years later. Who, I And I, nobody disagreed with me. Yeah. Well, some people said, no, nah, it'll be a few weeks. No big deal, but no, nobody was saying to me this could be two to three years. Nobody right. um, was saying that to me, at least. Maybe I wasn't reading the right material, but you know, my my point is with the Texas storm, with um, you know, obviously the situations in Europe uh, surrounding Ukraine and the natural gas price. I was looking at this overnight. That you know, as I say this, I think natural gas in Europe is at an equivalent of thirty two dollars. Uh, eight dollars and fifty cents or so here in the states, which is a lot more than two or three dollars, which is kind of what a lot of people have built into their models. Right. And eight dollars is a big jolt. Thirty-two dollars, and I a few months ago it was forty dollars. I mean, these are these are, are things that um, again, who's predicting the effect of military conflict on supply and logistics? And I've I've personally have learned a lot about. Um, the freight, um, the freight systems for rail cars and chemicals and plastics throughout Europe. I wasn't aware of where the key exchange points were, and you know, and what's imperiled and what's, you know, what's a what has become a workaround. So right. these are all things that I think we we take out of this, never forgetting, and 
and you know eventually becomes an efficiency in the market learned yeah. it, it, you know the hard way i suppose yeah we we changed you know that march april time frame during covid started and we ran our podcast via go to meeting so we have probably i don't know 6 8 10 episodes with the four of us and like it was on the the um, reel that the team made that like, we look at the Brady Bunch and these like four squares on the That's podcast. That's how the morning but, news started to work because nobody yeah. was coming in the studios either. And we kept yeah. doing it. I've, I've never gone back and listened to like the March, April, May episode. Like I'm sure, you know, especially, you know, myself and AJ and Rob are making predictions on, oh, you know, we'll be home for another two months, whatever it is. So same kind of thing. Like and right. I've never gone back and listened to it, but obviously at the time we were making, you know, kind of public predictions like, oh yeah, this will be over in, you know, however well, because long. Because you're but, living life, right. you know, and, and again, that was the, the, I always say, you know, that that's, a, a great uh, look back on demand yeah. that nobody bought anything. I mean, you bought everything in the second half of March here yeah. in the States, everything, you yeah. know, liquor and food and, and toilet paper and all the things. And then there was a real demand drop off for about two months. Yeah. And um, we saw it in the construction markets in particular, the home construction, not new homes, but the home improvement markets. People, yep. we're going to be here for the summer. I'm building that dream backyard. I was one of those people. We're redoing the kitchen, not next year, now. So you had, you know, the, the, the price for anything PVC, made from PVC or certain polyethylene, yep. you know, pipes and things. Yep. The demand, you never had a seasonal slowdown. You did have, a, you know, you had more demand for trucks because you weren't doing things internationally. So things that were playing out that you, of course, like you say, you could hear in your own podcast in March or April going, might be a long month. And then by the time maybe in August, you're like, just finished building my deck, yeah. you know. <laughs> yep. That, um, yep. yeah, the, you know, to multiply that, we're still seeing... The effects in the, I think personally in uh, in various home improvement markets, and there's some markets I think we all saw, you know, it's very sad medical devices demand went, you know, <clears throat> very high, and um, things that that a lot of people who could predict, you know, the personal protective equipment demand surge, the creation of such products, and um, but then the question is, you know, how how sustainable is that? Right. And then, you know, when you get a plexiglass shield up all across the grocery store, do they actually replace it once a year? Is this a new thing? Yep. I don't know. You know, so that's where I think we're still learning about demand trends. And um, and certainly in certain single-use packaging, it is sanitary, but it also we're seeing, you know, the kind of not the resurgence like it's gone away in a measurable way but i think a lot of uh, a lot of things went out the window with covid like single use plastics great even though we said the opposite last year you know <laughs> because they're sanitary yeah. um you know and now i think it was uh earlier this year starbucks in particular were saying you know they're going to do a reusable cup Okay, I see. I, I I think that they're, of course, you know, reusing anything. I can understand the rationale, but I think that there's still enough of a health concern that I'm not sure, you know, and I don't usually call out brands by name, but that was one that's a very public thing, you know, back to the reusable cup. And I'm like, I don't know if we're there yet, right. you know. Right. I mean, we were practically at a bring your own fork to the restaurant <laughs> yep. experience yep. with reusing and keep it local. That that's you know we're using plastic forks at home, so we don't infect each other at right. the beginning. Of the yeah. virus. So, yep. Yep. you know, so I do think that there's things that on the demand side, we're we're still we're still experiencing, and even you know, like I was saying earlier about um the situation with ports in Asia, you know, and certainly it could happen here again, too. We saw a lot of plants, particularly downstream plants or older plants, or it was on our list to do to get a better ventilation system. There was nothing wrong with it, but guess what? You know, it increased the chances of whatever. Yeah. We had entire plants shut down in certain sectors, you know, be it food or, or whatever, automotive, yep. that, um, you know, that... These are efficiencies that have come out of it or improvements. And, you know, but speaking to our own households, uh, maybe in the kitchen remodel, you bought all new appliances. You probably won't buy any for another 10 years sure. or more. Sure. So that was, was that a demand bubble? We saw like Peloton built that or tried to build that massive plant in the U.S. just, oh. to, just to go sell it because all of a sudden, you know, Peloton bikes went like this because you go back to the gym now. And people missed each other. Yeah. 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 yeah you know, so th I think that, you Figuring know. Figuring out the new norm. Exactly. That, um, 
And that's that's true for I I just think so many markets it you you can try to predict, but there was so much that we didn't see coming, so I think it goes to follow. There's there's a lot we don't yeah. we still don't see coming. Yeah. But I think we've all gotten quite an education in the past three years about scenarios that we can continue to plan for even if they don't happen. Right. So if your business is dependent upon shipments from China, you might feel okay, things have been running all right. What if the port's all shut? What are we gonna do? Yeah. That might not have been a part of your plan. Well, something we talked about for a long time. Now. Yeah, like, you know, don't just understand where your raw material A comes from, understand how they get that remote raw material. What is that made of? How does crude oil going up impact that, which impacts this? You know, kind yeah. of understanding your supplier, 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 supply chain as best you can. Absolutely. You know, versus you never had to think about that. Absolutely. Um, you, you talked briefly, and I don't know how closely you watch it, but obviously what natural gas is doing between the U.S. and Europe, mm -hmm. that was obviously a, a big topic we talked a lot about when the whole Russia-Ukraine situation started. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how closely you follow it, but what is kind of the current situation with natural gas in Europe? It's still obviously at higher levels, but coming off maybe a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that with any any supply chain, be it power grids or natural gas supply, you know, Stuff that is um, institutionally and related to the government and citizens and things like that, it's very challenging to pivot. You know, there there isn't, uh, let's, let's do this for natural gas. So I think the situation that's, that was created by the conflict is still being worked out. Yep. You know, that there may, may be spaces that there's improvements, but... I, you know, I'm still reading about, you know, talks are ongoing to activate this storage and that storage. So that's why we still, you know, at this point still have very high prices in Europe. And it might be something I look at, you know, world oil in certain countries that used to be real drivers that you don't hear from anymore. So there could be a, a real shift away from supply that put certain areas in at risk for price yeah. and supply you know that I, I definitely think that uh that that that's something that we'll see addressed and more options open up and you know and that's really what smooths markets out are options right. and creating more options um it, it's more than just a few months of what about this it's putting together coalitions especially when it's multi nations so that's where i i don't think there's anything I'm not expecting to see anything quickly, but there is, um, you know, there's a longer term faith that there's there's going to be movement on creating more options to eliminate volatility. And we don't have to be talking about war. We could be talking about, you know, 2003 natural gas in the States, you know, that anytime you have fewer options, that creates, you know, the risk for extreme volatility. Yeah. and. You know, again, it wasn't every propylene plant in the United States that was shot by the winter storm in Texas, but it was most of them. Most of them, yeah. And of the PDH units, it was all of them. So, again, anytime you've got that lack of an option, extreme volatility is possible, and we've seen it happen. Yep. Should we talk about ethylene a little bit? <laughs> Look at that smile. My heart. <laughs> my heart, yeah. Ethylene, um, you know, again... I think that ethylene is, um, and I might be, you know, just misreading this, or, or but it's uh, it's one of the, m the most ubiquitous to me. It's um, when it's not the primary raw material, an additive is an ethylene-based additive. You know, you're finding it in, to me, almost every product. But I do think that, um, you know, ethylene, of course, in the States is you know, it really benefits from the not just low cost natural gas, but even lower cost ethane, right? So ethane at this point is above 60 cents a gallon, but that's still roughly, you know, on a per pound basis, a 20 cents per pound. So it's still profitable. Um, but, you know, for, for in, I don't know, in more usual times in the past decade, we've seen the ethylene price, you know, be somewhere between 20 and 30 cents per pound and the ethane price also be around 30 cents per gallon which on a per pound basis is like 10 cents so it's been a I think there's been um a, a very uh, decent margin for a lot of ethylene 
in the past. And I think that and it's not that people are losing money in ethane per se. It's just uh, the, the economics of ethane rejection and ethane use and, and ethane exports and all of this, um, that all the markets are able to to make money. I think that, as I was saying about propylene volatility, there are inherently more participants in the ethylene market, which I think inherently limits its potential for volatility because there are more options. Sure. Something that um, I was about to refer to, something I famously said, as if it was famous <laughs> when I said it, but something that I noticed when ethylene in the U.S. began to be commoditized in the sense that... Um, Prior to 2001, ethylene was always traded in a proprietary basis. If you owned ethylene storage and somebody else owned ethylene storage, you could sell them ethylene. And you wouldn't report these deals to people like myself because if you're reporting FOB, Freeport, Delivered Point Comfort, you might as well just tell me the names of the companies. Right. And you couldn't escape that because all of the storage locations and pipelines were proprietary and site-specific. When Mont Bellevue was commoditized to uh, as a storage space that, that was leased, it was leased to anybody. You you could have bought ethylene storage if you had the money. Me too, right? That um, I'm surprised you didn't with how much you love it. That nobody trusts me with money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. But um, having an anonymous hub like Henry Hub. So having dozens of people that you, you, obviously the people in the hub and the people who own the hub, they know who they are, but the, I don't know who they are, the market at large, sure. dozens of people trading, bidding and offering, and now you're getting uh, the rise of the brokers who, you know, and people that are out there in the market saying, I got a bid here, I got an offer there. This thing is transacting and it's all Mont Bellevue. I didn't really see any force majeures. You know, force majeures were a big thing in ethylene. Your plant shut down, you declared force majeure. Yep. And there was as much trepidation as there was because it was an unknown. If ethylene's going to start trading every day, what does this mean? What about the volatility? But I think that um, that over time, any pain points or concerns have really stabilized in the sense that there's enough collective stewardship that, you know, again, when you have dozens of people in this market every day that there's very few outliers, you know. Um, and that's where I I think that, um, that the ethylene price doesn't get too far away from itself, if that makes sense. Sure. And like I say, with with so many more people being involved, having that, that storage capability, even though the storage may be the end of the line for them. They don't own a plant. They own a book, right. you know. But they're, uh, they're rather than declare force majeure, you can go out and buy some ethylene. And that was not necessarily an option 20 years ago. So, And that's where if this product trades enough and gets liquidity, which, you know, it's, uh, it, it's getting there, that's what enables the risk management. So when people ask me, which they do, what's, what's ethylene going to do in six months? I have no idea. But I do know if we're in June 2022, you can buy December ethylene. You can buy January 2023 ethylene. You can buy a calendar strip for 2023. You can buy forward. So this is where you do see people that are schooled um, in how to trade energy and other markets where they're hedging, they're able to bring this particularly to companies with packaging exposure. But, you know, really anybody who's got a significant exposure to ethylene or propylene, you can go right to that market as a proxy hedge and say, I'm on the hook for this much product with which represents this many million pounds of ethylene, so I'd like to hedge that. You can lock that price in already six months down the line, a year down the line, which I think a lot of people find to be more, um, I was going to say soothing, but I don't know, more comfortable than forecasts. Because you at least know what you're looking at. Forecasts are a feeling. Yeah. And I mean, the forecasts, of course, are ed they're very educated. It's it's not as though they're based on feelings, but your forecast is, you know, again, you you might see this with inventory controls. People saying, "I have a feeling that I'm I'm not going to need as much if the price is going up." Okay, right. and you know, feelings are great, and may you be right in all your feelings. But when you're when you're able to go out 
especially for large multinational manufacturers, and say, I have secured this risk that I, you know, that I have exposure to. I've secured it for the next 24 months. That's different. You know, that's a different um, statement. Yeah. So. Yeah, it gives you, you know, like you said, more comfort, more ability to plan and forecast and see what's coming. That puts people at ease a little bit, I'm sure, more so than propane markets. Yeah, I have, um, uh, you know, just I collect different anecdotes, you know, from people that, that do this sort of thing like hedging and a large uh, bottle. It was a bottle consumer. It was a person buying bottles. And he said, I don't need the low price. I need the, the known price. Right. He needed to make his number. And he made his number when he knew the price because he locked in the price. So I think that sometimes there's a perceived barrier to entry saying, but what if I lose out and the price is lower than what I bought at? I'm not sure if that's the the way that a lot of companies look at it when they're looking to lock in shelf space or they're looking to lock in their own 12 and 24 month scenario. Sure. They can work this all the way back. Once you're working it back to ethylene, you can work it back to ethane. You can work it back to natural gas. So you can you can really get that entire supply chain in, even if your own product is not hedgeable on its own. That proxy hedge for you know for propylene is usually a, an excellent one, and ethylene has proven to be a pretty excellent one too, in my opinion. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, should we talk about styrene a little bit as well? The, the last of the four that you oversee. Oh, styrene. Yeah. <laughs> I um yeah, I often think that styrene, especially in the past year, to me, that's been the most interesting market. They're all interesting, but styrene is the one I keep, you know, looking at going, my goodness, you know, it just a week ago it was doing this. And again, I think it's the preciousness of the number of assets. And that's you know, you can go from um a seemingly sleepy price to to a, a very high price quickly. So I do think that, um, and again, styrene is so directly related to to finished goods that when, you know, as, as we were saying, when you're faced with the possibility of not being able to produce something, will you pay for it? So that's where I think styrene in my observation alone is uh, is the sort of market where sometimes you'll see a price going, oh my goodness, you know, they really, they went for it and went for it and went for it. So that's where um, I found myself the most surprised at how quickly that market can ascend and stay there. And we'll we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, I think styrene to me is also, I guess anecdotally, one of the more... Um, I want to say, I don't know, adaptable, maybe inspired markets where styrene, you know, or polystyrene was associated so closely with food packaging and clamshells. Well, that's fallen out of favor. And then it, it's, uh, you know, used in to make CD jewel cases. And now we stream. And, you know, yep. the, that polystyrene in particular seems to have this resilience of innovation that it, you know, it, it, um, you think you see the end, and here comes something else. Yeah. So yep. you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I I enjoy looking at again. What are you know? What are the real world implications? Something that I don't know a lot about, but I'd like to look into. So hit me up if you know about this. <laughs> is um materials used to make gift cards? Hmm. You know that from what I've understood in my very limited research is. Certain grades of plastic, you know, you're not going to eat a gift card. So it's not the same sensitivity as a straw or, you know, something that's going to touch the body. So gift cards in particular are something that you can, you maybe have more flexibility of product grade. um, And and what does that do for parts of your portfolio that are dropping off? Or could you make them out of one product one month, one another? Does it matter? So that's the sort of thing that I think of in terms of, downstream use and adaptability and innovation that, you know, it's a um, baby pacifier over here, gift card over there. Um, you know, people talk a lot about, we haven't even talked about recycled plastic, <laughs> but, um, you know, that recycled plastic has a, a lot of great benefits, but there's a, a limit to, you know, is are you putting something at risk for a tensile strength that is related to, you know, automotive? Right. You, is that really the direction you want to go? Or, 
again, could it be a gift card? You're still using the the, the material. Yeah, so. certain, certain applications that are more potentially accepting of renewable products that may have, diff, you know, a, a, having a little bit less quality in a gift card is probably less big of a deal than, like you said, the automotive. Or, or an airplane. Yeah. Yeah, let's 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 skip the skip the airplane. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, are you seeing? Um, I get. I've been trying to wrap my head around what's the right phrase. Is it renewable, sustainable, green, and circular? Uh, yes. You know, but um, <laughs> I've heard a phrase all, all that, the above. Yeah, you know, and then uh, for a while, at least for me, I was hearing bio, and then I would dial it back. Almost well, not actually made from plants. It, you know, it, it's a catch-all for I think what has lately been called the greening up. You know, people want to green up their chemicals yeah. and how can, what are the limits of greening up certain chemicals in terms of cost, but also in terms of their performance? Yeah. So I don't know, do, has that really sunk into your segment of the world? It, it very much is. It's, it's actually interesting. We just had our sales meeting last week that like we talked about and some of our suppliers came in and did presentations. And I think every single presentation had a portion of it that talked about all of those words, sustainability or circular or bio-based or, and everyone approaches it differently and talks about it differently. Some, it was one slide, some it was half the presentation and every company kind of sees things differently. Um, I think it's tough to differentiate what's actually happening. I think there's some companies that have a good reputation or are doing great actual things. And then there's, you know, some companies that it's a, it's a buzzword and it's something to think about. I'm not talking about our suppliers or the presentations, just the world in general. It's, not. It's, but yeah, no, the, you're, you're diplomatic. Different, because different, different companies doing it differently. And it reminds me of Shale, right? Every company came out with commitments. Most of them have performed on them, but, you know, it, it, took, it took longer for some than others. Every company every company and this is bigger than just big chemical yeah. this is big chemical little chemical manufacturing all processing of anything delivery you know the the green um fuel transport yeah. everything carbon credits plastic credits that you know all of all of the things that are emerging to to help people green up yeah. is you know as it were but um but I also think this is where relationships, to me, are very helpful because you, I can drown in statements issued by companies, and I'm not sure what a lot of them mean even, but I can say to people I know what's happening. And if they say, not real sure, yeah. then, you know, that's... I know I'm not missing anything. That's my biggest thing as a as a news and information provider. I don't want to miss anything. I yeah. don't want to read about something that's news to me. I want to write the news. And so I, having I, a certain degree of like, okay, nobody is really, you know, doing anything in this space where I haven't seen anything, I'm right. Okay, yeah. I'll keep watching it, but nothing is, has happened in a measurable way that I've missed. But everybody is talking about their own options of how to proceed in this space in a commercially sound way, right. as well as, of course, environmentally sound. And I think we're just so early on in it, relatively. I mean, it's been a big thing the last two, three, four, five years, and lots of companies come out with their goals and statements and things they're going to do in 2030, 2050, whatever. And mm -hmm. A lot of that's not going to work. You know, I'd say 60, 70, 80 percent of things that these companies say aren't going to work. But those 20, 30, 40 percent of things that companies start doing or try to do that will work will make a massive impact. And there's what people are going to grow on. We're just so early on in it. I think I'm more of a marketing guy. So I think back to like, you know, MySpace and some of these social media platforms that didn't work. But MySpace led to Facebook, which is now one of the biggest companies in the world, which has made impacts and changed you know how all companies operate. So just because a company says they'll be carbon neutral by 2030 and doesn't hit that, you got to start somewhere. You got to get somewhere. And I think right. we look back on this conversation in 10 years, you know, two or three or four things will have worked and, and that'll make a big positive impact. So yeah. there's a lot of talk and a lot of stuff going on. People just don't know what's going to work and where it's going to go. But I think it's a lot of I think good you're conversations. Onto something. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right that, you know, the, the statistic I had read is similar. It was uh, between 60 and 70 percent of of stated projects by whatever subset it was in in the manufacturing space maybe were not on target to meet their goal on time yep. that you know that by their own admission they were only five percent of the way there and their commitment was made three years ago so at this rate how can they possibly make a 2030 deadline yep. that sort of a thing i think you know we're we're hearing more about but to your point that if you know if 70 percent or 60 percent are running late or not at all 
it's the ones that do run that become your first movers and they are they will set the standards for practices so again it might not be 2030 it might be later but once those first practices are followed yeah, but it takes know. it takes setting a twenty thirty deadline to realize it's actually going to take until twenty thirty seven to do it. But because at least by twenty thirty seven, you're going to do it. Gonna do this it. company did instead of the way they planned it initially. Right, and every other company yeah. can do it more efficiently and better and whatnot. So yeah. we're on the right track, I think. We always are, yeah. you know. I mean, eventually, yeah. <laughs> everything the market bears out things, you yeah. know, in terms of demand, yeah. items that make no sense or movements that make no sense, or yeah. in some cases where you, you know. Talking about LNG, you think you have an import market, you actually have an export market. Yeah. You know, that yeah. it, uh, it it all does move along, right? So I'm going to wrap things up with the question I'm sure you're peppered with everywhere you go. And that is... May what's, 8th. What's good? When's my birthday? <laughs> yeah, that's my brother's birthday. Really? Yeah. It's a magic day, Great apparently. day, great day. Now, I'm sorry I cut you off. No, the, so the, the question, in addition to your birthday, so everyone, you know, we'll put her address in the bio. Please send her a present next year. Oh, um, my gosh. Is, so is, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is, is what's going to happen? You know, what, what is going to happen towards the end of this year? What's going to happen towards the end of next year? Obviously, four different raw materials and, and markets that you're looking at, but kind of in general, you know, what, what should companies be doing? What is your recommendation? What's going to happen in six months? What's going to happen in three months? You know, I know you have a... I gave you a little TCC gift bag, and I know right next to that is your crystal ball that's going to tell you what's going to happen yes. in the future. Um, so what what is going to happen? Thank here? you for <laughs> asking. Um, well, again, I do think that at this point in the game, I would hope that a lot of companies do know what's going to happen for themselves through the end of the year if they're telling their suppliers or not, but that internally. And that, I think, is different than a lot of... I think companies might go quarter to quarter, but now I think they're going six months to nine months to a year out. So I do think that the rest of this year, I believe, is probably set. It's just not... The information's not, you know, who's telling their their sure. own secrets first. But I, I do think that there, um, there will be continued volatility in some of the markets that, that we're talking about because there's been extreme volatility in the past six months, you're go what goes up must come down. You know, that it might feel as though the markets are uh, frantically trying to normalize or stabilize, but, you know, again, to take, you know, a $6.50 market and say, we can't really function unless this market is $4 or something like that. You know, again, just conjecture. It's a long way, so the question is how swiftly. So then it's the, the rate of change, and we don't have a lot of time left in this in this year. So I do feel as though, you know, people in general might be updating their models saying we do need to get to this price, and I believe the market will normalize or stabilize there. What's the timing of it? Right. And so maybe it's not so much a question of, what will happen? It's here's what we need to happen, but ha what's the timing look like? Yeah, you know. And, and we heard a lot of the similar things. You know, again, go back to our sales meeting. We had a lot of companies presenting that big companies and have their own economic teams and whatnot. And almost all of them projected things to come back down. But just like you said, I don't know if it's going to be in September or if it's going to be next July or if it's going to be January 2024. You know, things people have said will come down. Just like you said, just a matter of how quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's really um, gauging. Gauging your own minimum needs and exposure and then, you know, essentially being forced to act on certain needs and exposure that you have. Yeah. So good luck, everybody <laughs> in the markets. Is this crazier than like the craziest kind of time period that you've experienced in your career? I feel historic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly feel as though, um, you know, looking probably like you and a lot of people here saying these past five years, you know, we could all get together and write books on this. This this is historic markets, historic life, but historic markets for sure. Well, I've only been in the industry five years, so to me, See, this is just normal. You, brought, you, you ushered the change. <laughs> I brought it in, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we brought change. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Where uh, where can people find you oh. or get more info from you or subscribe to the the data you're publishing? Tell, talk you know, talk about yourself a little bit for for a second. Why? Thank you for asking. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as I said, our our um, we are 
Opus. Um, Patrick M. Wire is a, is a brand name under Opus. So it's opusnet.com is the Opus site. We're on that as Patrick M. Wire, Patrick M. Wire itself, patrickmwire.com. And um, of course, they could always call you and you have my number. I do. And, you know, yep. uh, there's all of that. We are, uh, we're also on LinkedIn and social media. But yeah, I um, thank you very much for, for asking on that. And I look forward to being invited back. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, just the fact that you want to come back is, I guess, good news, good news for us. So we'd, we'd love to have you, you know, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, whatever the, whatever the deal is that works out. It'd be great to have you on yeah. with some frequency. Um, and we'll put the links and, you know, maybe your email address or something like that in the show notes wherever you're streaming yeah. this so you can quickly get a hold of, get a hold of Kathy. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to address the viewers directly. If you need a data, data history, let me know. That's what we do. And hopefully during, uh, I'll be able to give you some visual aids. So hopefully you've been able to see some, uh, some price trend slides or uh, presentations yeah. as an addenda to this. And um, yeah, and keep in touch. And you're very active at trade shows. So, you know, AFPM and whatnot. You're I'll see you at the conference. Easy to find. <laughs> Um, but yeah, as always, thank you, Kathy, for taking some time for coming thank up for you. a couple of days. We really, really appreciate it. Um, hopefully a lot of good information in here. Um, as always, obviously our podcast is available both in the audio format as well as the video format, uh, via YouTube or our social media channels, uh, website, you know, we, we make it as easy to find as possible. So this episode will certainly be shared on, uh, on LinkedIn, hopefully shared on Kathy's LinkedIn as well. We're going to tap into her network here and yes. see how true her predictions came. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, thank you, Kathy. Thank you all for listening. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for streaming the View from Jamestown podcast edition. Like and subscribe for more.